Hello, people. I have finished a book. Uh, again, I can't even see the screen. There's bugs in my face and everything, so forgive me. Acebound. Shipwrecked at the Edge of the World. This is the story of William Barents. Uh, the Barents Sea is named after him. And the three expeditions that he took uh, from the Netherlands over to Nova Zembla. And I'm a little bit familiar with Nova Zembla. Most people probably haven't heard of it. Uh, this is a little bit older than most of the other uh, polar exploration books that that I've read. This one is in the 1590s. So, going from the Netherlands to Nova Zembla was a big deal. Uh, they say a lot in the book that, that uh, you know, nobody had ever been to Nova Zembla, but I'm pretty sure they had. Uh, uh, the Russians. I have new glasses that are really weird, like like if I look up like this, I can see the, see the phone. If I look down like that, that's that's for long distance. Uh, the book was published in, in 2021, so it's it's uh, it's it's really good. The author must have put the whole thing together with guys from the expedition w with their uh, like their diaries or, or their their logbook because there's an awful lot of details in here that that she couldn't have got any other way 273 pa pages uh, William Barents and I really I think I went overboard on the reading here so so let's see second paragraph page 25 second and third paragraph page 25 Not only are these new glasses, but I've, I've had some beer. <coughs> Barents and his fellow crew members knew some things, but it wasn't enough. They possessed no scientific understanding of gravity, no telescopes, and no calculus. Though they, though they could find their latitude, they couldn't yet determine longitude from aboard a ship. They were centuries away from deciphering the germ theory of disease. More than a hundred years would pass before humanity would discover that lightning was electricity. Decades remained before doctors would realize that blood circulates in the body and that a cell is the unit of life. As he sailed into the Arctic, Barents would, in time, encounter wonders and terrors without understanding most, most of the forces at play in his universe. He'd likely never heard the groan and crack of ice above the creak of a ship, the noise that carries across the water before its source can be seen. The crew had never seen a polar bear and hadn't yet learned how white bears could move almost invisibly in a landscape of ice. They knew of scurvy, a disease that created sore afflictions among sailors, but they didn't yet know its cause. Its cure would, would be identified, forgotten, rediscovered, and doubted again for another three centuries. Uh, 1590s. Actually, they, they left on their first expedition in May of 1594. And of course, this whole time, uh, the Netherlands are at war with Spain. It's a really weird war that went on for like fucking 80 years. Uh, Nova Zembla. It, it is a like a crescent-shaped island. I, I'd love to go there. Uh, first expedition. First paragraph, page 65. They have trouble with polar bears, or maybe I should say polar bears have trouble with them all through all the expeditions. The polar bears just want something to eat. First paragraph. Carrying the corpse of a walrus, the skin of a polar bear, 
and two live falcons, the fleet sailed back in the harbor on the day of the Am- Amsterdam City Fair. Barents and company met with a jubilant reception from the burghers of Amsterdam. Jan van Linschoten, the merchant's representative, continued on to The Hague, where he reported to Prince Maurice the discovery of a navigable, if treacherous, northeast route to China. And that's what they were doing this whole time. They were trying to, to get, a, get a route to China up above Russia. And, uh, you know, I guess it, it's actually done today, but uh, I don't know how much time it saves them. can't be a whole hell of a lot. Uh, on the second expedition, there's the polar bear attack that kills two guys. They discovered Spitzbergen, and uh, you probably have to look at a map to, to see where Spitzbergen is. Uh, north east of Spitzbergen is Franz Joseph Land, and it's on the map that's in this book, Franz Joseph Land, but they don't they don't have it marked as such. Barnacle geese. And this is, this, this is not the first time I've run into the barnacle geese thing. Uh, second paragraph, page 106. Along with being the first known humans to set foot on this newfound island, they'd accidentally solved a long-standing mystery about the geese. Because these birds vanished each year from their European habitats and returned the following year, but were never seen laying eggs or nesting their eggs, it had been a matter of folk superstition common in England and Europe since the 12th century that they grew out of driftwood, or perhaps shells grown on a barnacle tree that fell in the water and matured. The theory had skeptics from the beginning, but was accepted even by birding authorities well into Barents' time and beyond. They found where the barnacle geese were nesting, so so they they tried to put that to rest. All right, where the hell's my other notes? At? There it is. Fucking blew away in the wind. Uh, second paragraph, page one hundred eight. A lot of reading. I apologize in advance. Uh, when exactly this gap between ag- magnetic and polar north was discovered isn't clear. In earlier maps, the North Pole itself was generally depicted as a mountain of magnetite, but German compass and clockmakers seem to have made accommodations for the discrepancy as early as the 1400s, and Christopher Columbus definitely understood it during his travels in North America. Barents knew the difference. The map made from the records of the voyage would still depict Magnetic North as a magnetite mountain, but distinct and some distance away from the pole itself. Uh, The North Pole, the geographic North Pole, is different than the magnetic North Pole. The third expedition is is where all the action is. They 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 get crushed. Their boat get gets crushed in the ice. They have to live on uh, Nova Zembla throughout the winter. They build themselves a cabin, and they begin to die slowly, one by one, from scurvy. One fifty five fourth paragraph. One, two, three, four. In Barents' era, sailors drank nearly, nearly a half gallon of beer each day in winter, and more in summer, for as long as their ship's stores lasted. It was weaker than beer produced centuries later, but it did contain alcohol. Along with bread or ship's biscuit, beer was a source of B vitamins and calories. More than ship's biscuit, it was also a diversion and a way to sustain life. They drank a lot of beer. It was weak, though. Uh, Barents actually dies. Uh, They spend the winter on Nova Zembla, and they they have a hard time. They want to get going in the spring. Their ship has been crushed, but they still have a, a rowboat and a launch, they're going to, you know, there's only like 15 of them left alive. They have to split up and take these two little boats. But Barents, he gets loaded in the boat, but he dies. Uh, third paragraph, page 234. 
On the next day, John of Harlem, the nephew of Claes Andres, lay on the ice and breathed his last breath. The loss of a fifth man, the third to die in three weeks at sea, reduced the company to twelve. If he wasn't buried on land, he was likely left on a flow or lowered into the water with a prayer. That's, you know, these guys were starving to death. They were, they had scurvy. They didn't have time to dig graves. Third paragraph, page 243. And this was interesting. Because I... I'm interested in scurvy and why they didn't know what the hell was going on. God damn it. Uh, the last day of July brought clearer skies, however, and they took the opportunity to row from their island to one nearby where they'd seen two crosses. It had looked as if traders had visited, but any, any who'd come through were already gone. The men decided to go ashore, and once there noticed something strange and startling in the pale landscape. Spoonwort, a kind of grass, grew in vast quantities there. They hadn't seen a fruit or vegetable in more than a year, but quickly set to work eating the grass. Spoonwort, a low creeping plant with round leaves, would later earn the name scurvy grass. Common in parts of the Arctic for centuries, it contains large quantities of vitamin C. Nearly a century after Barents sailed, an Eng Englishman would write a whole book in praise of scurvy grass. Last paragraph, page 266. I am almost done. Barents reached the small outposts of rock and moss that he'd christened the Orange Islands in 1594 on his first voyage. Garrett de Vere wrote of the explorers cresting Nova Zembla's northern coasts and seeing about 200 walrushen, or seahorses, a wonderful strong monster of the sea. When our 2019 expedition reached the same island, we spotted countless walrus lolling ashore at the same spot. Sasha, one of the crew members, pulled out an accordion-like instrument known as a garmonica, and began playing a haunting Soviet-era waltz. Dozens of walruses swam out to meet us, watching the performance with fascination and snorting at us in response. The author goes to Nova Zembla and, and actually walks around where the cabin was and everything. It's pretty cool. Uh, one of the things about Nova Zembla is it collects driftwood, and, and these guys were able to, to find driftwood and to light fires to cook food and to light fires inside their cabin to warm up. But now, <laughs> the author says, not only is there driftwood, but the shores are covered with garbage. So, you know, that's what happens. Thanks for watching.